Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, thanks for coming along. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Josie Pakanan, who's going to talk about the Maison build system. Thank you very much. Is that better? Yeah, good. So, uh, my name is Josie Pakkanen, and I'm here to talk to you about the Maison build system. Um, just to get to know the audience, uh, who here are already using it in, in some capacity? Okay, there are a few hands. Um, who are, would like to use it but currently aren't. There's a few, and how many of you don't know what it is? About a third, okay, good. So let's start with the simple things. So what, what is it? Uh, Mesen is a build system, uh, but it's designed for multiple languages. So we support currently C, C++, Java, D, Rust, and a bunch of other ones. And the idea is that we should have one uh, specification and you should be able to build all languages rather than every single one of them having their own silo in which to do, the, do things. We are optimized for uh, modern operating systems, modern tool chains, and not HPUX from 1989. Uh, if someone wants to do the port to make it work there, that's great, but it's not driving the architectural decisions on the project. <laughs> uh, what we want to do is be fast and efficient because looking at text while it's scrolling in the terminal is not very productive, so we want to minimize that as much as possible. Uh, Scalability, uh, the target that we have currently is roughly like this, on the size of a, like a Chromium or a Firefox, so have very big applications, that you, but you st still compile them on a single machine. Uh, we don't uh, have any like something like Google size, uh, but we try to design the system so that, that if that ever becomes an issue, we can scale to that, so not do any, anything obviously stupid to prevent this, this kind of scaling. Um, Build system is a bit, bit special because if you think of something like an editor, what you want to do is to make the experience of being inside the editor as much nice as possible because that's where you're going to be spending most of your time. But the build system is like, that's not where you want to spend your time. You want to be somewhere else because it's not very productive. So we want to minimize the amount of time that you need to write your build definitions and wait for something to happen with the build system. And uh, another design principle is that build definitions should be simple and they should be readable. So if you open a random project, go to a random directory, see what they have there, what you should be able to understand what it does based just on that one file. And you don't have to go traipse into the entire thing to see that, oh, this actual variable is later changed due to some weird things somewhere else in the, th in the tree. Um, so let's create a sample project, see, see what, what this looks like. Uh, so when we start with a completely empty directory, so there's nothing in here. And then, uh, can you actually see the text? Yeah, okay. So then we run the init command. Uh, if you know uh, cargo init or git init, it's pretty much the same thing. So we specify that we want to have a, a library with this uh, given name and create all the files for that. And then it does and it prints you the, the, file, the commands you need to compile it. So then you run the configuration step. So it uh, sets it up, prints a bunch of information, and then it's ready to, to compile. And then you invoke Ninja, which is the, the backend tool that we use for building. And then you get your final result out. Uh, and then uh, it also created a test executable. So if you just run Ninja test, it will run that, see that it, it's working, and print out all the results for that. Uh, and then we do the install. So uh, in this case, it's a shared library. So it installs uh, the SO file and the header file, and also a package config file. All of these things are generated automatically so you don't have to spend your time working on that. So the project that we, we just saw has some, some simple features. So we created a shared C ex library and there's a text executable. And you can configure it, you can build it, you can test it, you can install it. Uh, it doesn't install the test executable because it doesn't really make any sense. And once uh, it also has the package config file so it, it uh, then causes it to automatically integrate with all the stuff that you have in your distro. Uh, it works in all of these things, uh, including Solaris. We actually have Solaris support. There was, there was port for that. Uh, and last week, uh, there was a guy who sent, sent patches to add AIX support. Uh, they're not currently merged because of certain issues, but uh, if you are a fan of AIX or IBM Big Hardware, this might be a thing for you to use in the future. Uh, 
we conformed to the distro layer requirements. So this was run on a Kubuntu machine, which has multi-arch, so it installs into userlib x86.64 instead of userlib, because this, this is how it, it's done on this particular machine. If it were on some other, other thing where you have userlib, it would install it into userlib. Uh, and you can also run cross-compilation on this. It just works out of the box. You don't need to change anything in the build definitions. Now, so who's actually using it is, is usually the second question people ask me. Uh, and if, you had, if I had asked this, this question one year, year ago, the answer would have been this. So there was a preliminary port of GStreamer. And people were using that, uh, but not much else. Uh, there's some, some smaller projects we're working on it, but well, no. but if we look at the situation today, then uh, GStreamer uh, is fully using it. Uh, it's a very large multimedia framework. System D uses this. It's, it's now the own build system that they support. So they threw away all the old ones. Uh, there are many GNOME projects which are using this uh, stuff like uh, GTK uh, version four, Glib, GNOME Builder, Nautilus, and a bunch of other things as well. Uh, the Enlightenment uh, uh, desktop environment is using also. Uh, the Enlightenment one is, is interesting because usually when a large project starts using Mesen, they start filing bugs. Okay, we have this thing, and, and could you and this is a bug, and could you get it fixed? But for Enlightenment, uh, we, this didn't happen. We just only found out about it afterwards that they had converted, and it was, was kind of nice. Uh, there's uh, PTV, which is a a in, written in Python, uh, non linear video editor. A network manager, which is, uh, I would probably guess, running on most of the machines here. Uh, the X server is also using this, uh, which is the windowing system of today, and uh, Wayland, which is the windowing system of tomorrow. Now the mirror is slightly downgraded, uh, is going to use as well. This, I don't think that they're currently merged in master yet, but there works as work on that. And in addition to the uh, X server, you also need 3D drivers, uh, so Mesa 3D is also uh, in, in the process of converting, converting to use Mesen. They have currently four build systems, I think, but they're gonna get rid of one or two of those, the other ones. Uh, there's also a transition ongoing for GIMP, which is like very large, large scale application, to like, and then to see that it scales these big things, you need to provide OS 10 packages and Windows packages and all that sort of stuff. Uh, there are proprietary projects going on. Um, the uh, problem with companies that they're usually quite secretive, so you don't really know when, when something is happening behind the scenes. Uh, but due to various uh, readings of tea leaves, we, uh, we know that there are people using this for firmware projects and, and internal projects and all that sort of stuff. And there are a, a bunch of other ones as well, but they just didn't fit on the slide. So if you look at this, this is pretty much exactly what Kevin Costner told us would happen. He said, like, you have a cornfield, then you build it, and they will come, and, and things are easy and, and fun and magical. But, like, is it really? So let's look at the history. So first commit ever uh, was made on, <coughs> excuse me, the 23rd of December in 2012, which is five years ago. Uh, and then uh, work went on, and after one year of, of development on this, what, what were the things that we had achieved? So there was maybe one user, it's unclear. So, so there was a guy who asked for stuff and then he disappeared and, and he might have used it, maybe not, I don't know. There were about three patch submissions from, from uh, outside of uh, the core development team, which at this time was me. Um, there was lots of feedback um, on various internet discussion forums, which was basically this, it's like, why are you doing this? It doesn't make any sense because we already have auto tools, we already have CMake, we already have whatever you have. Um, and there was a Fosnum Lightning talk that was accepted uh, for the year 2015, I think. Uh, yes, so, and that's, um, that's pretty much where things stand. So I had the, the Lightning talk, I had some good, good discussion with, with a bunch of people. And then uh, six months later, what happened was absolutely nothing. There was like zero communication with anyone. Uh, and uh, what I tried to do all the things where you submit to conferences and talk on the internet and everything. Uh, uh, there's a list of conferences, uh, talks have been rejected. This is not complete, 
And some of these are multiple times. Um, but uh, this was to, like the sort of feedback you would expect. But then what happened was August 2014. And during August 2014, something interesting happened uh, of which I became aware of only much later in a very far off distant weird place, uh, specifically this one here. Does anyone here know what, what this place is? Not, not the Glengarry is the bottom, but the, the one at the top. So this is the location of the professional delegates networking session of LCA 2015. Are there people who were there in the room? Ooh, a few of you, okay. So uh, here I had a chat uh, with uh, Robert Collins, who was uh, one of the members of the paper committee of LCA that year. And then uh, he told the secret method by which papers are selected. So, so you divide the papers into three groups, where you have the definitely yes, then you have the definitely no, and then you have the big blob of maybe, and then the, the committee members come together and do battle on which one of these gets accepted. And uh, Robert Collins uh, wanted this paper to be there, or presentation. And, and all of the other <laughs> members of the committee was like, no, this is not interesting. Uh, and then he did battle and he really insisted on it, this needs to happen. And eventually he was victorious and it was accepted. And the, the end result is that he spent, I don't know, maybe like a few hours on battle on this. And the thing is that these are, <laughs> are interesting, the most important work anyone has ever done on this project. And the reason for this is that uh, the project was about a year and a half old and there was zero traction and it already did all the things that I needed it to do. And it's like, there's only so much time you're willing to spend shouting into the wind. And, and if the, the LCA paper was kind of like, like last ditch effort, so let's, let's try this and see what happens. And if it hadn't been accepted, it's very likely that the project would have just gone away because there was no interest. Uh, so LCA 2015 happened. Um, I was a bit flippant and I, I had, uh, had the, the title as uh, Making Build Systems Not Suck. And uh, about 10 minutes before the presentation, I was chatting with some people, and one of them gave me uh, words of encouragement, specifically that I'm not gonna see a talk because I don't believe that there can be a build system that doesn't suck. <laughs> so I'm armed with this, this encouraging words. Uh, I went out and I did the presentation. And uh, uh, then something interesting happened because uh, there was now a community. You could actually, there was a community of specifically two people. It was uh, me, and uh, Igor Gunetenko, who was, uh, who was a federal packager at the time, I think now he's working for Red Hat. So we had a community uh, of the two of us on an IRC channel chatting about things, and every now and then someone would come in, ask for advice, and then leave. Uh, but anyway, so if you have a community, then the obvious question is that, uh, how do you get the most out of it? And uh, there's a like, wonderful analogy here to Lindsay. So if you, if you assume that the, your community members are photons and they're flying around in space, then what you want to have is something like the one at the top. You have something that like which concentrates all the effort that they have into one single place and you get the most out of it. Uh, because if you, if you have the same thing that's in the bottom, it doesn't matter how much people you have or how much work they're doing. If it just goes in all different directions, things just fall apart and nothing works. So what are the sort of things that uh, would be like a convex lens or a kind of like a concentrating elements. Documentation, uh, well, this is a fairly obvious one uh, because it's, it's, it was nice. Um, steady release schedules. Uh, you have features, you have bug fixes, and you have releases. You have features, bug fixes, and releases, and you keep those going. And even if you are a project where you want to keep your trunk always releasable, releases are still a good thing to have because they give you like a nice, nice uh, cycle to your project and, and it always, always try, motivates people to have actual releases out. Uh, getting quick responses to pull requests and, and merge requests and all that stuff, that's important because if they're just languishing in your bug tracker, that's, that's uh, not, not very useful. Um, uh, my apologies to all the people who currently have uh, outstanding bug requests in the tracker, but I'm here in the conference, so I can't really look into it, but I'll get back to them as soon as, as, soon as I get back home. Uh, ease of use is, is very important because uh, you, what you want to have is you have people and then you want to turn them into 
users and then into advocates. And the easier your, your program is to use, the faster they become advocates because it takes time to, to learn the ropes and start using it. And the easier it is, the faster conversion rate that you get. Um, this marketing. marketing is a bit of an ugly term uh, for some people, but marketing is basically all the things that you do in order to make sure that other new people learn about your thing. And one of the things uh, which is very important this is that you have a thing that actually works. If you have a project and, and it doesn't do what it says that it's, it's supposed to do, it's very, very divisive. So you really want to have, if you have, if you have a choice between a lot of stuff which doesn't work and, a, and just a few things that actually do work, you really want to do the latter. Uh, now, all of these could be a talk on their own, uh, but let's focus on the first one. And what is like, the main power of documentation? And the main power of documentation is that you don't have to keep answering the same questions over and over again on IRC. Uh, documentation is a bit like unit tests, is that you feel as if you write them and that there's not much point and it's just wasting time. But the point is that they actually save you time because now you can just point to people. It's like when they ask you questions, so yeah, that's over there. And they can find it on their own. And this is very, very nice multiplicative effect on these views. Um, originally, we had uh, a, a Git uh, a wiki it was in the SourceForge first, and then then on GitHub. Uh, the, there was a big problem with that, is because on on GitHub you can't do pull requests on wikis, at least in not in any easy way. So that means that the, the wiki is kind of like a separate world on its own, and changing it was uh, always you had to do it afterwards. So then what we did at some point was that we changed to this uh, documentation program called HotDoc which generates the mesonbuilt.com website from markdown files. And we moved all of those markdown files inside of the source tree. And this is the single best process improvement that we have ever done, because then when you ever you do any changes in the code, you have to do the changes in documentation at the same time. So it's always up to date. And if you have a project which needs to provide this sort of documentation, I highly recommend that you do this, because this will save you so much time and effort. Um, then looking at uh, differences, of, like what are those sort of things that are dispersive and, and uh, kind of like uh, destroying of a community. Um, incorrect documentation is perhaps the worst because you would think that, okay, now there's text in here, I'm going to do exactly what it does, and then it fails. And uh, you really don't want that. And the other problem is that uh, there's documentation sources which you do not control. One of them is Stack Overflow. And if the top Google hits for something in your project goes to a Stack Overflow question, which is incorrect, that's not good because then people get a poor impression of the project that you're running. Um, there's not much you can do about this, but like you try to do, do the best thing that you can. Um, uh, lack of project vision is one. Um, vision means focus, and focus means saying no. So if you try to do absolutely everything, you, it just things fall apart. And you need to have some way of saying, okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this instead. And the, the problem there is whenever you say no to someone, they might not like it. But then that's, that's just, you have to pick your, pick your battles. Uh, and then trying to do everything. Uh, and then what's perhaps a bit controversial is the Turing completeness, extensibility, and APIs in general. Now this is a bit contrary to to what's the generally uh, accepted knowledge, because you want to have everything that is maximally, uh, maximally flexible, and you can change things, and you can fix things on your own. Um, but we chose not to do that. And uh, to know why, we need to look into a bit of how uh, human psychology works. Uh, so this is a very good margin to get advice that people will always do the thing that's easiest for them with a time span of 30 seconds. So, and then within the next 30 seconds, I can either do this very easy thing, and then in the future everything breaks, or I can spend a bit more time and do it properly, and then everything is fine. And people will always do the easy thing. They will, like, if I can add a hack to make this thing work, they will do it. And uh, this has the problem is that uh, if you have these sorts of things, then every single project, when they reach some sort of problem, they're going to do their own thing, and things start diverging. And then if you want to combine multiple different projects and they all have their own hacks and quirks and everything, then it doesn't really work. So this thing we made very early on is that in Mesen, you cannot add major new functionality unless you submit it upstream. 
you have to write it in the Python code that we have, and you need to submit it upstream, and there need to be unit tests, and there needs to be documentation checks and everything. And the thing is that you f if there are problems, you fix them only once in one location and have tests to ensure that they keep on working. And this, again, focuses the work because you can't do crazy stuff hacks. If you want to do get something done, you have to actually do it properly. Uh, again, some people don't like this and they really want to do hack their own things. If they want to do that, there's make, go for it. Uh, but we are not going to do that. Uh, so, and then uh, things went on. And there was about six months later, summer comes along again. Uh, there is some uptake. There's not much uptake. Uh, but there's, there's interest going on. And then uh, something uh, interesting happens again, specifically here. Is there anyone here who knows what this place is? It's very, diff very far away from the previous picture. So this is, it's not Brussels. But looking from here, it's fairly close. So this is a bar in Gothenburg oh. during, uh, so in Sweden. Uh, this is during the Guarek conference uh, where I had a presentation. Uh, but uh, here's the, the bar that's opposite of the conference venue. And, and here is where I met with the uh, cheese stream maintainers, which were Tim Philip Miller and uh, Sebastian Dreux. And, and here on these very tables and chairs, we talked about uh, like build systems and, and because GStreamer was having a bit of a problem, they had people who wanted to use it with Visual Studio and the old one that they had, the build system they had was very much not working with that. So they needed something else. And this was important because there's a very uh, important rule of business is that until you have a very big customer, you're pretty much nothing. You can like, so the same thing with, with open source projects. Say, hey, I made this thing. And, and the, the, the question is, well, is there someone like big using it? And if the answer is no, then, then it's like, okay, this is interesting, but I'm not gonna bother with it. So we really need to, to do the sell. The first, per, first sell is like someone with, with like big thing, is like existing thing, and thinks, okay, we're just gonna use this other thing. And gives you uh, credibility in a way that, that speaking on your own doesn't really help do. And uh, for Messenger G Streamer was, pretty much the first project, I'm like a major project to take this risk. And uh, the, the GSM developers have been very helpful. They added a bunch of stuff to mention like new features and stuff, stuff that are necessary. And also the uh, Nurbik Chauhan, who's the co-maintainer, is also a GStreamer developer. And then, so there was the big sale. And after things, things have been fairly uneventful. And, and it's like steady stream of, of of projects uh, starting to use it and so on. So then now we have a project, now people are using it. So then the obvious question is, what do you get out of it? When you work on a, uh, <coughs> a pro first project, what do you get out of it? So do you get money out of it? Well, let's see, um, I did some maths um, and see where the, the money was spent uh, during the, these years that I've been working on this. So there have been conference trips to these locations. Uh, and if you do like rough, rough estimates, if you go outside of Europe, it's about 2,000 euros. And if you are inside of Europe, it's about 1,000 euros. So the total amount of money spent on this project is about 17,000 uh, euros, give or take a few. Uh, now, uh, Mesen doesn't have any sort of uh, corporate backing behind it. And there's no sugar person who just gives out money to, to, uh, to do stuff, uh, except that that's probably me. So this is all money coming out of my own personal pocket. Uh, this is like a hobby, it's a fairly expensive hobby, but it's not sailing, but still it's a fair amount of, amount of money. So then this is how, well, how much money do you get out of it? The complete list of, of, of things that I've gotten is here. So the centricular is, is the people running the g project. They have a consulting company. And they bought me food a few times. So this would roughly be about zero. But um, there's one more thing which is not missing here, which is the all important free beer <laughs> we all know about. So if you assume a five euros a beer, then $17,000 means one beer every day for 10 years. And if you live somewhere where the beer is cheaper, 
then it's a lot more per day. But if you drink five beers a day for 10 years, your life expectancy is probably going to be less than 10 years. So this is not probably a very good way to recover your costs. And uh, this is a big problem, if you think about it, for, for new projects. Uh, we like to think like you post your, your code on the internet and then people find it and everything is fine. But that's not really the case. Um, like uh, talking to people in person is a very powerful thing and, and they, like, you treat people differently once you have talking to them in person. And that means going out and meeting people. And that means money because travel isn't free because Star Trek teleporters don't work yet. And this uh, thing is that if you are not fairly well off, this is a big problem because you can't put in the money to do all these trips. Uh, there, but there are other, like you could have a, like a Patreon or tips or the like. Uh, but this is not really a good solution uh, for many people. So if you are a developer with a full-time job and you're only doing uh, a society thing, then uh, the Patreon money is not really useful because you have to do a lot of work, like do, do the taxes and all that sort of stuff. And you get a small amount of money, but you have to use a fair amount of time. And in most projects, time is the bottleneck, because time is the only non-renewable resource. And if you trade off time to get a small amount of money, that's not really, like, overall health-wise, a good thing to do. Um, and so time is, is a bit of a problem. And even there is, is the relationship thing, because for the most almost the entire time that the Mesin project has existed, I've been single, and I have the time to, to spend on these. Uh, but if I had something like a family or children or something, this probably, project probably wouldn't exist. There's like no justification for using these crazy amounts of time to do your free software projects. And, and this is a bit of a problem, because then it, it rules out a large fraction of people away from the pool of people who can actually contribute and create new stuff. Um, another thing which you can get out of working for free software is employability. Uh, there have been several talks on like, like if you are a uh, maintainer or create free software, you become very employable and people will want to hire you. And so is this actually true? Uh, well, based on experiences, this is actually true. So I have received job offers based on things I've been doing. As you probably can guess from the ellipses, there's more to this than meets the eye. Uh, and the thing is that uh, for one job offer that I got, uh, there was specifics in that you're not allowed to work on any free software things on your free time. So like, no, not happening. And there was another one which was that uh, you can work on it, like your stuff on your free time. The problem is that during the day, you work on project X, and then on your free time, you work on project Y, one of the stated goals of which is to make Project X not be, like, be usable anymore or be worthless. So you get like a schizophrenia thing where you, on your free time you're working to undermine the company you work for. So it's their problem. So the thing is that uh, you, it does make you employable if you're willing to kill darlings. For some people it's totally fine, uh, but this is, uh, for many people this is a big problem. And this, uh, like looking at in a wider scope, so there are lots of these uh, core infrastructure things that we as a like, free software community need and want, and the things that which are not in the direct business interests of any company. So there are lots of uh, wonderful projects that are being worked on and provided by different companies, but they also always have things like, this improves our bottom line, therefore we do this. But there are a bunch of things which are usually in the, in the lower levels where uh, it's not in the direct interest, so, they, so companies don't want to invest in this, which kind of makes sense. So the question is, how do we get these sorts of uh, projects uh, running and, and going? And the, the question is, that, like, do nothing and wait for random thing to fix things for you. Is this really like a sustainable way of creating core infrastructure? Like the track record is fairly good on this, <laughs> but like still, it seems, seems like a bit, bit, bit of a strange. Okay, so. Uh, we are now at uh, month 61, so uh, this is today, and what can we expect for in the future? Uh, well, there are a bunch of things which are happening. Um, one of the things, major ones is that there's this thing called RAPDB, which is a kind of like a package manager 
dependency provider that we have. The idea is that it provides you a way of getting dependencies that works on all platforms. And it also works so that if you are compiling on a Linux machine and you have the dependencies available on your system, it will use the system dependencies and, and only if they if the dependencies aren't, okay, cool. they are not available, then it downloads them and, and compiles them and builds them. And this works for uh, Linux, Windows, uh, OS 10, iOS, Android, all that sort of stuff. And this has existed for something like three years. And there are a few things uh, in there, but it's, it's been dormant for a while. But recently there's been more and more, more uh, interest in adding to this. Uh, as an example, so last week or two weeks ago, we added support for the Arduino core libraries. So now if you have a uh, Mesin project you want to use for your Arduino, all you need is the, the tool chain to be installed. And then you just say, uh, I, I have my firmware project here and I want to use the Arduino uh, libraries and it will download it, compile it, build it and just do it transparently. And this will work on all platforms. So it's kind of like having the Arduino IDE, without the IDE, you can use any IDE that you want. Uh, this is also um, a thing where like, if you are interested in running this kind of dependency thing, well, please come talk to us. Nice to have, have someone actually running this. Uh, this is uh, currently run by, by us by, with the spare time that we have. And it would be nice to have someone to, to give it all the love that it deserves. Uh, another thing which is, uh, we're starting to work towards, because compiling software is simple, so let's make it harder and start compiling, compiling actual hardware. Uh, so currently we have uh, a bit support for FPGA. It's not uh, like streamlined yet. But as an example, you can do all sorts of cool things where if you have a firmware software piece of software that you have, then you can compile that with GCC into RISC-V, which is a fully free uh, ISA. And then you can, uh, using, again, GCC tools, you can compile that into Verilog. And then you can take that and the processor definition for, for RISC-V, which is also free software, freely available. And using a fully free tool chain, you can compile that into a bitstream and then upload that into your FPGA. And uh, if you want to get even fancier, what you can also do is that you can take the same Verilog files and using, all, again, fully free tools, you can compile that into a thing that you can send off to a fab lab to be fabricated as an actual chip. So it's kind of cool. Um, so these are things we were going to, but um, perhaps the most important things that we are working on is uh, Bug fixes, features, and releases. So, same old, same old. Uh, this has been my talk. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I'm ready for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for that. We've got any questions? Oh, this is where I get fit. So, I've been involved in uh, the Mesa conversion for the X server and Mesa. Um, one of the hardest things for us to deal with and one of the reasons we were um, not super excited about moving to Mason is that it was another build system for us. Um, we are hoping to replace auto tools. Things are looking pretty good for that. But the fact that we still have to have Android.make files um, is our biggest build system burden. Um, is there any hope for getting Android.make support? Um, one of the stated goals of Mesen is that we do not have a make backend. We will never, ever, ever have a make backend for any reason. Uh, but we, um, but I think that the problem that they had was that there was the, the source file thing, and it would, if you would have like the source file listing, which is in some format, you can read it both from from the MK files and and Mesen files. And, yeah, that was something we could add. Uh, but I, uh, I haven't looked too deeply into the internals of how you actually build the Android itself rather than an applications that are running on it. So I've investigated Mason a bit for C and everything else and the Rust documentation I couldn't really find, but how much have you tested uh, multi-language support within Mason, such as a combination of D, Rust, C kind of, kind of builds? Or is this not something that you've in, done too much? Uh, so as an example, so, um, um, I, I use this uh, tool called Polysnake, which is a project 
that creates a Python uh, extension module that uses uh, C, C++, Rust, and Fortran in the same module. So multi-language support and within one target is something that we definitely want to support. And we have, have stuff working on that. Uh, the, one of the problems here is that uh, most programming languages that which are new uh, have uh, very strong opinions on how they should be built. And, and the, uh, they really want you to use their own tools. And uh, not to name names, but there, are, there is at least one language which says that, we, okay, we have this compiler, and then we have the, the package manager, and every single, no one should ever touch the compiler. You should only use the package manager to compile your stuff. And this is like, okay, it, it makes perfect sense for if you only have one language in your project and you want to do that, but it immediately breaks down if you have five. And, and like, then they say, look, well, but you can just call into this. You can just add the things needed here to compile this. And then the problem is then you get an n-squared algorithm because if you have five languages and they have five build tools and they all need to talk to each other and it's, it just breaks down. So, so having, some, well, having like a lingua franca is like awesome. We really, that's, and that's something we're aiming for. And, and for like, if, you, if you're developing a new language, you might, might consider of like, just not write your own build tooling, just use ours, just send us patches, we'll add it in. And then the extra benefit you get from that is that most languages have, like, oh, no, no, sorry, C and C++ have a dependency problem. It's really hard to get those. Every other programming language also has a C and C++ dependency problem because every, any non-trivial program is gonna use something that's in C or C++ and you want to compile it from source savings now and then. And then you need to marry the two and we want all of that trouble to go away. So you just like build this thing, I don't care how. Other questions? Any other questions? Whilst I'm running around, I did have one question. Um, in one of your slides, you indicated that having an API was a potential smell for a scattering effect. Yeah. So the thing is that if you have an API to do something, uh, oh, let's, let's, okay. The problem with programmers is that you give them a chance, they will start programming. <laughs> and, and the thing is that uh, then, okay, I could just do this, this quick hack and then everything goes away. And the problem with that is that if you ship an API, then you really want to be committed to that. You want it to be stable, like API stability, ABI stability, all the stuff. And that means you can't really change the internals and really, really, really want to do that because the, the, um, if you look at the internals of Meson, the, the way that modules talk to the core, it's just like, here's a structure of everything, go nuts. And we really need to, like, if you wanted to export a proper API, then we would need to do a proper thing. And it's not really clear how you would uh, create a proper architecture of that. But if everything that's using this code is in one repository, then you can do any changes that you want. And it's very easy. And, and there's really no reason to have five different implementations on how you put, to enable stuff like Android Sanitizer. There's just like one. Let's, let's have one, have it do everything that we need, and then we just don't have to care about that anymore. Okay, um, for me, haven't used Meson, never heard of it. Interested? Auto Tools is not my favorite thing. I'm sure you get it a million times, but PostgreSQL, very conservative project, takes forever to make changes to anything. Why? Why Meson? Okay, um, so as an example, um, if you compile glib on, uh, an ARM board, so something like a Raspberry Pi. A running configure takes 15 minutes. Uh, doing the same thing with Mason, it's about five seconds. And incremental builds are really fast. And the uh, thing is that uh, usually when people have an auto tools build system, there's no one who maintains it because no one understands it. And the, the thing about Mason is that like, this is a thing that you can actually understand what it does and, it, and uh, Windows support. If you want Windows support, then that's like, like no discussions there. You need to, have, if you have auto tools and you want Visual Studio support, you need two build systems. And that's like, there you go already. So you really want to have one. Uh, for Postgres, you probably want AIX support and Solaris and HPUX. Um, someone would need to submit those, but we will be happy to accept patches. But um, the reports that we've gotten from people is that if you switch from auto tools to Mesin, 
it's an order of magnitude faster to compile, to configure, to do changes. And we do all sorts of crazy magic stuff to uh, like skip linking and all that sort of stuff, uh, which makes, what, so if you have something like you have a shared library and then you have 28 different executables for tests, and if you change the shared library, traditionally what happens is that it will, it will relink everything. But uh, what we do, and this is something that we stole from LibreOffice, which they stole from Chromium, is that when you create a shared, executable, shared library, you take a list of all the symbols that it exports. And then when you do the relinking, it's like, oh, the list of symbols is exactly the same. I don't have to relink. And just skips all of that. I, I saw you looking a bit grimace, but it actually works in production. And it's, it's great. <laughs> and the best part is I didn't implement it. I just stole it from somewhere else. So it, I know that it actually works. So my background is similar to the previous um, person at Samba, old established project, done the, the, the build system change thing once, you know, it nearly ripped the project apart. Um, why, but where it, we chose WAF, which turns out to be a bit of a dead end. Um, is it worth, you know, convince me that I should do this again to choose something that, that might not be a dead end, particularly as what we, we ended up with something we ended up with being very Samba special because we kind of tried to be, oh, it's not quite autoconf, it's not quite WAF. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a disaster. So, um, but how do I get from that to, to your tool and like all the configure tests and all of those kind of things? And I can... I'll do it first in my project and make you look old and slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um, so I actually looked into the, the way Samba is built with WAF. I was like, see if I could do a conversion. And then there was the Samba 3 executable function and Samba 4 executable function and stuff. It's like, yeah, this is interesting. Um, for Samba, what you would probably want to do because uh, it's in Python. So what you could do is that you uh, change WAF in a way that, that just like it reads it in the, the data and then just like spits it out in some sort of saner format. And then you like you write a conversion script basically. And, and I couldn't really understand what it's doing because I don't have the, the mm -hmm. domain knowledge. But someone who has the domain knowledge could probably say, like, okay, what we need to do to, is to do this. And you should, like, if, if everything goes well, mm -hmm. then you should be able to do like, most of the work with the conversion because, uh, because it's implemented in Python. So you, you can actually reach into the guts and do stuff in it. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> this is the first time I've heard of Meson. So Apologies if this is quite obvious to anyone else. Uh, so when you start developing Mason, it, as you said, there's a long period of time where nothing's happening and not very many people are using it. So what keeps you going? Well, like what makes you start the project in the first place and keep it going despite like the things that's discouraging you and asking why you, why you're doing this? So the, 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 there's the two S's: there's stubbornness and stupidity. <laughs> I'm gonna be right. Damn you. All right, so I had two minutes, so one more question. Oh, that's one. What do you need most? Sorry. Uh, what do you need most for Mison to continue and grow and be better? Um, well, we have like fairly good development team. Um, um, there's nothing like obviously broken. Um, Advocacy, that's always great. Uh, writing documentation, uh, all this sort of stuff. Um, patches to fix stuff, they're, they're also always welcome. Um, one thing which is um, a, a, like a bit different is that uh, in, in Meson what happens is that um, the person who makes the decision on whether they merge code or not is me. So that means that I have to review all of the code. It's, it's kind of, um, maybe we'll, at some point we're gonna change that, but, but for now, like for like, project vision like unity. We really want to have this currently now. Other people in the development team might disagree, but that's a different topic. But the thing is that uh, we get lots of submissions and um, it would be very helpful if people were to like review the, the patches on the tracker and say like, oh, this seems look good to me or, or there are problems here or something like that. Because that reduces my burden of, of having to do the actual review. Okay, I think we're out of time. So, thank you very much indeed. That was very interesting. As an old time mate guy, I certainly found something to think about there. Okay. Thank you.